Hey folks, Quilly Teen here. Today's video, we're going to be looking at the 5th edition Basic Rules PDF, which is available for free on the Wizards of the Coast website. This is basically the Player's Handbook Lite. Uh, it's got all the rules for creating characters and leveling them up and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's certainly, well, quite a few references in here to, hey, take a look at the PHB. So the idea is it's, get, it's got enough stuff in here to get you started and get you playing. Uh, but obviously, if you want a full set of rules and flexibility, you will at some point have to buy a product from, uh, from the D&D folks. So here we are, basic rules. I'm going to be talking about mostly in the context of what has changed uh, in 5th edition, as opposed to previous editions of Dungeons & Dragons, and as a disclaimer, I haven't played much 4th, I dabbled with it a little bit, not a whole lot, I also dabbled a tiny bit with Pathfinder, I'm mostly a 3rd edition player, specifically 3.5, 3 and I also have a lot of experience with 2nd ed, and some with 1st uh, with edition, I suppose you could go back, the original advanced Dungeons & Dragons. So, uh, introduction, a lot of this stuff is going to be very, uh, you know, same as any introductory uh, chapter in any D&D book, where it gives you the very basics, here's some dice, that sort of thing, the D20, uh, same thing as, you know, D20, add a modifier, that's all pretty samey at this point, but the modifiers will be a bit different, um, rounding down is um, this has changed ever so slightly because it used to be if you were rounding down and ended up with just, just a fraction, you would round down, you would leave it at least one, but it's implied here it would go all the way down to a zero. Round down if you end up with a fraction, even if a fraction is one half or greater. It, it is implied that it goes down to zero, so uh, one damage divided by two will be zero instead of one. Not, not a huge difference, but it's technically there. Uh, adventures, magic, three pillars, again, sort of backstory, there we go, so we've got the, uh, the creating characters step by step, uh, so they do have the example of building someone, uh, you know, the, the virtual Bob is making a, making a character here as an orc, so in the base book, there are four classes available, there is cleric, fighter, rogue, and wizard, um, and they do have, uh, well, no variants in the uh, the basic handbook over here. Uh, there will certainly be a lot of variants in the player's handbook. Uh, there are a few racial um, um, variants, though, which is kind of nice. Uh, hit points, same thing as uh, you're probably used to. Your first level, you do get your hit point maximum. After that, you roll your hit dice. Or they've explicitly put in the rules where you can choose sort of the average hit dice rounded up. So if you've got a 1d8 hit die, when you level up, instead of rolling 1d8, you can just take 5, plus your constitution modifier, of course. And this is the uh, the rule, the, the house rule that I've always played with and is probably quite popular. Some places do, uh, you know, average uh, rounded down, so it would be a 4 instead of a 5, but we usually go a 5, and the reason is your character can really be completely kind of screwed up if you roll a couple of 1s and you hit, hit dice roll, um, so personally I'm a big fan of that house rule. So the proficiency bonus, this is the first thing that will come up that is quite new to 5th edition. Uh, so the proficiency bonus, basically basically there's no uh, attack bonus anymore, um, and it has sort of kind of been replaced by this proficiency bonus, which starts at plus 2 for all first level characters. Now this proficiency bonus applies to attack rolls, but it also applies to ability checks and skills you're proficient in, tool checks that in skills you're proficient in, some saving throws and th saving throws. DCs and that sort of thing. Uh, so you've got this one number that sort of scales up and gets better as your character grows, and it gets applied to a bunch of different stuff. It's a bit unified, which um, certainly makes the bookkeeping a lot easier. I don't think we lose sort of a lot of flexibility. Um, I, I think it's probably fine that it's not, you know, it's not like the old system where, say, like with saving throws, you know, you, you had to, you know, oh, I've just leveled up to 14 as a wizard. What does that mean? Does my will saving throw go up, does my reflex save, does my fortitude save, uh, I gotta always check the chart. Here there's sort of one number and it just applies to the ones that you're proficient in which you do check off on your character sheet. Uh, definitely cuts back on the amount of uh, the bookkeeping and hopefully we don't lose anything kind of cool about it. So that's, that's the first new uh, big difference there. Um, and we can look at the chart of when this goes up later on. It does start as a plus two for first level characters. So by default, your attack bonus as a first level character is going to be, with with a weapon you're proficient in, would be plus two plus a, like your strength modifier. So you've got a strength of 16, you'd get a plus three from that. So that would mean you'd get a plus five to hit at first level. Um, and then yeah, it grows slightly different rates. Now, of course, Melee-oriented characters, for example, will get a variety of different bonuses and benefits to their attacks that, say, a wizard would not get, so we can look into that further. Ability scores are the same as ever, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. The official system for 
um, for resolving your ability scores is to roll four six-sided dice and drop the lowest, or, you know, record the uh, the three highest on there, um, and, uh, you know, do it six times in total, and then assign them as desired. That is the official system, old-school dice rolling, which is, of course, super awesome. They do prevent present the ability score grid here that you can use if you don't want to roll. You can just assume that you rolled sort of these and then use those, which is a nice sort of standard way of doing it. Furthermore, there is a... Um, a point building system. Here we go, a variant. If you want to do customized ability scores using a point based system, you get 27 points. We'll look at the chart down below, uh, down there. But uh, I think they do mention that you could end up going like 15, 15, 15, 8, 8, 8, or, you know, some mix in between there. Um, you, uh, you actually can't buy a score higher than 15 using this method, which is actually, I think, something that's really exceptionally good. Um, I think that the ability in, say, 3.5 to purchase points up to, uh, or attributes up to 18, which was actually uncommon. Most people did like a 16 or 17 just because of the way the cost scaled up, um, led to a little bit, maybe too much min-maxing. This uh, encourages just a little bit more diversity and balance and also makes very high um, ability scores quite exceptional. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing. So. Uh, what's next down here? Got to scroll a little bit e weirdly. Describe your character. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, flesh things out. The uh, the ideals, bonds, and flaws will come up a little bit later on. This is a, a concept that's not just a box on your character sheet that you might put in a couple of quirks on there. Uh, if you decide to use something called the inspiration rule, which is, I believe, the default rule in the game, uh, then these will come up quite handy, which is um, if you play to your character's ideals, bonds, or flaws, or trait, I think is another one, then which is... Um, assisted greatly by your background, well, we'll revisit this soon, then your, your DM might decide that you are inspired at that point, and then what you can do is you can sort of burn your inspiration to gain advantage on a roll later on. So advantage is one of the new systems that's worth mentioning. Uh, it's actually very cool. Basically, when you have an advantage on a roll, you get to roll twice, and choose the best die. If you ever have disadvantage on a roll, then you, ch you roll twice and take the worst die. So what are examples of this? Well, if you um, if you have surprise on someone, you often have advantage. There's different situations that can give you advantage that way. Uh, if you're particularly skilled in an area, you might get advantage on a test. You get to roll twice. An example of disadvantage is if you're trying to fire a ranged weapon while someone is in melee combat with you. So someone's right up in your face and you're trying to shoot them with a bow, you will get disadvantage on that. I do not believe you generate an attack of opportunity. In fact, I believe the only thing in the basic rules that indicate an attack of opportunity gets triggered is when you try to move away from someone that you are in a melee combat with without taking the disengage action. Um, other than that, attacks of opportunity are a little bit less common. Uh, and they, for example, they also don't trigger when you try to cast spells in melee anymore. So goodbye uh, combat casting. And uh, we're going to talk about a few different combat changes to spell casting, which I think is highly positive. But there you go. There's an example of advantage and disadvantage. And you can use your inspiration for that. That's pretty like edge casey. Um, but it does promote, you know, try to role play based on what you think your character should be doing and, and that sort of thing. It's just a little sort of a carrot to try to encourage a certain type of role playing. Yeah, we'll see how that works out and if, uh, you know, hardcore tables use it or not. Uh, inspiration doesn't stack. You only have one inspiration at any given time. You can only be inspired or not inspired, period. Anyway, so we've got abilities here. Um... So ability score modifiers work exactly the same way that anyone who's played from third ed and beyond should be used to. Uh, for every two points, basically, you get an extra plus one that applies to everything related to that stat. So if you have a strength of 15, then anything strength related, including melee combat, you'll be basically get a plus two on there. And that is uh, that's pretty much unchanged from a lot of stuff. Starting equipment is kind of cool because... Um, Based on your class and your background, you actually start with some equipment. We're going to take a look at that when we get to classes and backgrounds, for example. Uh, it means that the initial sort of shopping trip is kind of a lot more straightforward, actually, uh, which is really, really handy. You also get a few extra bucks to spend on some customized equipment. But it's, it's actually... I, I feel like it's a big win there. It's not a loss of customization because the stuff that's sort of kind of determined is stuff you're going to buy anyway. You'll see. There's options. Armor class is unchanged. 
Uh, it's you know, 10 plus dexterity modifier plus armor and shield bonuses and all those things. To hit bonuses work exactly the same as before. Here's the ability score point cost, by the way, um, that you can use. If you're using the, the point buy system, the 27 pointer, you can you can use that. So uh, yeah, with 27 points, that's enough to buy three 15s. Uh, personally, I quite like the idea of going for like 115, two 14s, which will bring you to 23 points, which means that you can then set, uh, you've got four more points left, so you can set two 10s. So that would be an eight, two 10s, two 14s and a 15 and I think that's a pretty cool little combination to go especially if you're playing one of the sub races that gets a plus one to a stat because then that would round that would bring the 15 up to a 16 which gives you a good bonus anyway um yeah, melee weapons use strength, ranged weapons use dexterity. There are some weapons with the finesse property, such as the rapier, and you can use your dexterity modifier built in. So weapon finesse is not a feat that you purchase. It's a property of the weapon itself, which again, I think is a huge win. It does suck to have a dexterity-based character have to always burn a feat to be able to be halfway competent in combat. So we've got that. Okay. Uh, you've got our level up chart. It's interesting to see the uh, XP numbers have uh, dropped somewhat. Uh, I wonder what their logic is here for making this. I quite like the third ed ones, which were very straightforward, which is always like... Um what was it? It, it costs you basically what your current level is times a thousand level up. So it costs you a thousand XP to go from one to two, 2000 XP to go from two to three, which meant that the total XP required to be at level three was 3000. It would cost you 3000 XP from one to three to four, which meant this was 6000 and so on. Uh, so a bit of a change there. It's interesting to see. You can see the proficiency bonus does not grow quickly. It's a much flatter kind of uh, a growth curve there, uh, which means there's not as much of a gargantuan difference in plain like dicing ability between say level one and level four and that will factor into your enemies and so on and so forth an enemy that's meant for a level four encounter won't have an ac that is dramatically higher than an enemy that's meant for a level one encounter uh, that being said there will be ma major hit point differences and you gain a lot of utility and different functions like that and in practice you can get a lot more benefits to your roles uh, as you level up but i think this sort of flat growth is actually good because i think it's it's nice that there's not a gargantuan hit difference between, you know, a handful of levels, for example. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit further on here. Um, uh, these, uh, these color highlights do mention sort of tiers of play. You know, the very novice level, your adventurers really are kind of new to the world. You know, a middling ground, it's starting to get really heroic, and then a really kind of legendary tier. But unlike 4th edition, these are not hard divides, where all of a sudden, as soon as you reach level uh, 10 or 11, I don't remember, uh, you unlock, like, massively different abilities that really change everything about the game that's really not how it scales up uh, but it does make sense because at like level five um that's when wizards start to be able to cast fireballs for example and you know that changes things a little bit so you know the, the sort of it, it's just a basic sort of ballpark guideline that you can uh, keep an eye on all right let's talk about races since these are pretty important they have definitely changed some things so we're going to start off with dwarves is this the first edition where humans were not first in the list i'm trying to remember it i feel like they're, they're alphabetical, but a lot of times humans came first. I'm not, I'm not sure. I might be imagining things. Uh, so the dwarves, very, very interesting how they work. First of all, you get a... There's no negative... There's no penalties to ability scores anymore. It's just a net positive. And I think that... Um, I mean, the, the actual gameplay result is exactly the same right? It just sort of changes the midline, but that, you know, it doesn't really change anything, but psychologically it's good. People hate getting a penalty. A penalty feels bad, whereas now you always get some sort of increase. You get positive stuff from your race. So as a dwarf, you get a plus two bonus to your constitution score, which will translate to basically an extra hit point per level just from this by itself. Age, you know, 350 years, alignment, you know, most of these are relatively the same. Size, you're still medium. Base walking speed is 25 feet as opposed to 30. Mo uh, every other character has a base speed of 30 in the game as far as I can tell, uh, but dwarves start at a 25. Your speed is not reduced by wearing heavy armor. Now, we will talk about the speed reduction for heavy armor a little bit more later on but this actually only applies if you don't have enough strength if uh, your heavy armor will reduce your speed by 10 feet um, unless you get either 13 or 15 strength depending on what the armor is uh, in which case it would be eliminated altogether but so dwarves are interesting in that you could have a low strength dwarf that can wear heavy armor without taking a speed penalty and that's kind of interesting, but that's, you know, that's a dwarfy thing. Dwarves have dark vision, so they can see in the darkness within 60 feet, and they get the black and white. This is 
as a dwarf, you should be used to having this. However, what will be notable is that elves get dark vision now. I don't know if low light vision exists at all, actually. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, Dwarven resilience, they get advantage on saving throws against poison. Again, that's advantage there where you get to roll the die twice when making a save. Um, and I think that's just a lot cooler than, you know, getting a, a numeric bonus. Uh, because A, you have to remember what the different pluses are. And B... So, you know, it's like, oh, is that a plus two for this or is it a plus five? I don't know. I mean, you can write it down or whatever. Um, but I also think it just it feels better and more consistent to just have two rolls. Because uh, even with a plus two, I mean, you're still, you know, it's only 10 percent more likely. You're still likely to roll bad. But with two rolls. I think it's going to work out a lot better. You also have resistance against poison damage, which will be explained later. I believe that means half damage as well. Dwarven combat training. So all dwarves automatically get proficiency with these weapons, axes and hammers, basically. Um, and proficiency will mean that you get to add your proficiency bonus to attack rolls with that weapon. Uh, so it's quite a nice thing to have. You know, you'll start off with the extra plus two if you're using these weapons. Furthermore, um, and, and while I think all the races, maybe not humans, get... Uh, proficiency with some weapons built in their racial type weapons um classes also get a series of proficiencies built in and that's pretty standard and there's also tool proficiency the uh you can pick one smith's tools brewer's supplies or mason's tools and obviously everyone's gonna take brewer's supplies because who doesn't want to make beer stone cutting whenever you make an intelligence history check related to the origin of stonework you're considered proficient in history and add double your proficiency bonus so um you don't have to be proficient in the history skill to use history on stonework as a dwarf and in fact you get double your bonus kind of cute whatever and you get common dwarfish languages for free now there are two sub races available for you to choose from as a dwarf you can be either a hill dwarf or a mountain dwarf again you you want to pick one of these you have to pick one of these i guess in a sense uh but they're they're net positives as a hill dwarf you get a plus one to your wisdom score notice that it's constitution bonus of plus two but a wisdom score bonus of only one and you get dwarven toughness which means you get more you get another hit point for every level which is just crazy because you're already getting tons of hit points with constitution score so obviously hill dwarves would probably make some pretty decent clerics and again uh if you want you can be a heavy armor person with a lot of uh you know without losing any speed despite not having huge amount of strength however you do need to be proficient in the armor to be able to cast any type of spell in it without penalty we'll look into that a little bit more and i think it's actually a huge huge win for fifth edition um, because the armor, like armor spell failure and things like that, or arcane spell failure, I suppose it should be called, was kind of a stupid, awkward rule that was really annoying and really dumb to work around. Now, in 5th edition, it's very simple. If you are proficient in the armor, then you can wear the armor and cast spells. If you're not proficient, then you cannot cast spells in it. Boom, done. Listen, you want to be an armored battle mage? you can do it. Just find a way to become proficient in heavy armor, and that's fine. Uh, it will cost you, you know, you could take, you can, if you're using the multi-classing option, then you could take one level of fighter, and then take the rest in wizard, and hey, now you're proficient in heavy armor. It costs you a level in wizard. Your spell casting will always be weaker, but you get to be armored. However, keep in mind, if you're wearing heavy armor, you're going to be slowed down unless you also burn a bunch of points into strength. So yes, if you want to be a strength 15 mage that spent one level on fighter, go ahead and wear armor. What, is that a good idea? I don't know, but it doesn't break the game, and if that's the kind of character you want to make, go and be awesome. So the other option over here is a Mountain Dwarf, which increases your strength by two, which is fantastic. And you automatically get proficiency in light and medium armor. Now this is kind of interesting, um, and actually Mountain Dwarfs might make the best sort of uh, battle mage, I suppose, because if you're a... This is appealing if you want to be a fighter, because the strength bonus is really, really good, but the Dwarven armor training doesn't really give you anything, which I guess you know, oh well, who cares, it's not necessarily a big deal, because obviously you're going to get this for free as a fighter, but that strength score increase is awesome. All right, let's take a look at the elves. The elves are actually quite interesting to me. Uh, so you get plus two to your dexterity built in. Again, you do not get any sort of strength or constitution penalty or anything like that. Uh, you know, they've got their age block, but you know, this is going to be varying by setting, so it doesn't really matter. Medium size, base speed is 30. And yes, you get dark vision, not low light vision, dark vision. So you can see in dim light, so in 60 feet, if it's dim light, you can see perfectly. If it's completely dark, it'll look just dim. 60 feet, dark vision, not low light vision. Um, and there you go. I think it's probably fine not to necessarily have one versus the other, but um, yeah, you know, it was kind of interesting to have both types of vision modes, but 
I, I don't know how much it actually added to the game, and it certainly added a little bit of extra bookkeeping. We'll see. You get automatic proficiency in the perception skill, which is very nice. So you'll always be able to add your proficiency bonus to perception checks, which uh, which do come up fairly often. This is spot and listen has been combined into a single perception skill. And honestly, we house rule. When I played in 3.5 ed, we house ruled the same thing. We, we got rid of those. We also uh, changed move silently and hide into a single stealth uh, check, which is exactly the same thing that 5th edition has done. So I was like, hey, look at that. We were ahead of the curve. Fey Ancestry, you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and you are immune to sleep-oriented magic, which is pretty standard old-school elfy stuff. You still get the trance ability where instead of sleeping, you just meditate deeply for four hours a day instead of sleeping for eight. Languages, you get common and elvish for free pretty standard stuff of course everyone can speak common and yes you can speak or you can pick a sub race there's the high elf variant which are the more hoity-toity arcane kind of types you get a plus one to your intelligence score automatically which is very convenient if you're playing as a wizard you can set a 15 in your intelligence score and then get a plus one here to go up to a 16 and get that sweet sweet plus three modifier you get the elven so it's interesting that the um the, uh, the base elves, there's no base elf weapon training. It depends on your subtype entirely. So as a high elf, you get long sword, short sword, short bow, long bow. Why do they flip the order around like that? And, and this, I think, is very cool. You know one cantrip of your choice from the wizard spell list, and you use intelligence as your spellcasting ability for it. So the cantrips are your, your classic zeroth level spells, but... Um, this is going to be a bit of a throwback to say 4th edition where a cantrip can be cast as w at will. You don't memorize it, you don't do anything like that, you just know it, and then you can cast them unlimited amount of times. It means that as a wizard, you never truly run out of spells. You always have some base level spells, so you don't have to, you know, because it always sucked at like level 1 through say 3. As a wizard, you got to cast like, I don't know, one and a half spells, and then you were out, and then you had to just use, I don't know, a crossbow or something like that. Well, now that's no longer the case, and actually the way that you memorize and cast spells has been changed uh, a fair bit. Um, so this is a bit of a, a fourth edition thing, and while I was not generally a massive fan of fourth edition, I love the fact that the wizards always had at-will spells to cast. Now, what's interesting about the high elf ability here is that this cantrip... This is something you gain regardless of your class. All high elves have the ability to cast at least one cantrip. Now, this this stacks okay with a wizard, because as a wizard, you start off knowing three cantrips um, out of the possible list. So getting that fourth cantrip is maybe not quite as, you know, woo, as getting a random spell as a, an elven fighter, uh, but it's still pretty damn handy. Do keep in mind, you still need to be proficient in armor if you're going to cast cantrips in armor, but that won't be a problem, because if you're playing a, a high elf fighter, then you'll be proficient in armor, and then you can still cast your cantrip. And as a high elf, you gain an extra language for free, because why not? The other variant is the Wood Elf, which increases your Wisdom score by one. And you get proficiency in, oh, again, Long Sword, Short Sword, Short Bow, and Long Bow. They're clearly laying the groundwork for additional alternative types of elves. For example, the Drow, which are not in this book, but they do they do talk about them slightly. I'm actually surprised the Wood Elves don't get proficiency in, like, a spear or something like that. Oh, apparently Wood Elves have a base walking speed of 35 feet. And Mask of the Wild, you can attempt to hide even when you're only lightly obscured by foliage, heavy range, falling snow, mist, and other natural phenomena. Personally, I think that the High Elves are way, way, way cooler sounding, although a Wood Elf would make a better cleric type. So there you have it. Uh, halflings come up next. Ooh, I forgot about the Halflings. My bad. If we take a look at their abilities, they get a plus two to dexterity, and they are small. They are size small as opposed to medium, and their base walking speed is 25 feet. Oh, I forgot about that. I forgot that the halflings also get the, uh, the shorter thing. They're lucky when you roll a one on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, basically anything that's a d20. Uh, that's not true. Not a skill check. My bad. Uh, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. This is different from advantage. Advantage allows you to roll two dice simultaneously and then choose the best one. This is just if you end up with a one, then you can re-roll the die. You can re-roll it. You probably would want to. Why would you want not want to? And then you have to keep the thing. So that's actually a really good trait. It's not a once per day or once per encounter. It's just every time you roll a one, you get one free re-roll. Really good ability. Brave, you get advantage on saving throws against being frightened. You get nimbleness. You can move th through the space of any creature that is a size larger than yours, which is probably really handy, actually. You can usually uh, move through your allies, but this allows you to move through uh, foe tiles relatively easily. And you might say, what about attacks of opportunity here? Again, the only thing that it causes an attack of opportunity in 5th Ed that I saw at a glance is moving out of melee range without using a disengage action. You can 
safely move around someone in melee combat um, and you will not draw an attack of opportunity which I think is great because it makes sense that while you're fighting someone you should sort of be able to shift around and of course in fourth edition you had the shift action and in uh, third edition you had the five foot step rule that you could sort of use to move around a little bit um, but that has actually been they don't have that in the system I think they've tried to see if they could eliminate something and just you know can we is there a way that we can structure things that allows us to sort of kill an extra rule to keep track of? Well, apparently they've managed to kill off the five foot step. And I think at a glance is okay. The ability to move around should be okay. We'll see how it goes. Languages speak common and halfling. And, um, and that's it. And there's two variants. There's a light foot, which increases your charisma by one and naturally stealthy where you can hide just behind another creature, which is kind of a funny thing to do. And then the stout halflings, which give you plus one to your constitution score. Constitution is always good. So that's probably going to be a pretty popular one. And you get resilience, which gives you the advantage against saving throws against poison and resistance, just like the, uh, just like the dwarves, for example. And then finally we have humans, the generic race. Now, humans have a very very tempting ability in previous versions of the game you're used to humans getting like say a free feat but feats are not present in the basic rules they will be in the php although they're presented as sort of an option you can I, you know whether it's a table option or just a by character option uh we'll see how it goes but if you're playing with new players it might be a lot simpler not to include feats so what do humans get if we take a look at this Humans get plus one to all ability scores. Wow. Now, if you do use feats, you can change it to you just get plus one to two ability scores, and then you get a free proficiency and a free feat. But in the base thing, they just get plus one to all the things. That is pretty good. Although, a lot of times, you know, a plus two in something very specific to your character is better. I think, I think it's fine. When I first read it, I was like, that's insane. It's overpowered. But the more I think about it, I'm like... No, that's probably okay. And honestly, in the uh, in the variant here, I I would probably take the thing that gives me a free feat all the time because I like feats. They're usually very very handy, and getting a bonus to two separate ability scores, even if it's just a plus one, is probably fine. So yeah, I think it, I think it works out. You have to remember that the other races which, um, you know, get plus two to a con or dexterity or something like that. Remember, there's no penalties anymore if you're used to third edition. So this basically just keeps the humans at the same sort of baseline level as everyone else. And that's their only ability. That's their only unique ability. Uh, they get common plus one extra language of their choice. And that's it. No other special abilities. So getting the extra ability scores make a heck of a lot of sense. And that's it. That's it for the races. So let's talk about the classes. So again, there's just the four classes in the basic rule set. Uh, there is a reference somewhere I noticed in this document to the Druid. So potentially the Druid will be in the player's handbook. I don't know about the Bard or anything else like that. I haven't really kept track of what's going to be in the PHP. So Cleric, we'll go relatively quick. One thing you'll notice in this chart here is the hit dice have been brought up a little bit. The fighters are still a D10 uh, and the Clerics are still a D8, but the Rogues are also a D8 and the Wizards are also a D6. Uh, and I think that that sort of flattening of the HP curve is probably a good thing um, just to make it a little bit less like crazy on the wizard. And you might say, well, that sucks. Like the fighter no longer gets like, you know, to be just stronger than everyone else. Oh, you just wait. You just wait. You'll see exactly how tanky a freaking fighter can be. So uh, saving throws is worth mentioning at this point. They are not um, if you're used to, um, well, third or fourth edition, you're used to three sets of saving throw, a fortitude, reflex, and will. And they were calculated a few different ways between the different editions. Now there's a saving throw for every attribute. You get six different saving throws, and they apply to different things. And I actually think that's really quite cool, because... Um, while it adds more things, and generally speaking, it's nice to strip away things that don't need to exist. The fact that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between saving throws and attributes actually makes things a lot clearer for new players. When you say fortitude saving throw, you always have to remind them that, hey, this is based on your constitution. So now you just say constitution saving throw when you get hit by poison. Boom, done, sorted. I like it. Every class is automatically proficient in two saving throws. Um, and then they've got armor and weapon proficiencies built in. So a fighter will get all armor and shields, plus simple and martial weapons. A cleric gets light and medium armor, not heavy armor. Shields and simple weapons. R rogues, or rouges as people like to spell, get the light armor, simple weapons. 
crossbows, long swords, and a few things like that. They actually get a pretty good selection. And then wizards only get dar daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows. Of course, they're probably not going to be using a weapon most of the time. If you are playing something like an elven wizard, of course, you're going to get your long swords and long bows and all those nice, sexy things. So let's uh, let's go down here for the cleric. You get your description block. You get a quick build suggestion that you can use or ignore. And then you get the actual class features. 1d8 hit dice. Calculation's pretty standard to anyone who's played anything ever. I guess 4th edition, the hit point progression was a little bit different. So this is a, definitely a throwback to 3rd uh, edition. And it's samey-ish to maybe 2nd ed type of stuff, but not really because they didn't have constitution modifiers. Proficiencies listed again. Skills. You get to choose two from history, insight, medicine, persuasion, and religion. And again, these are skills to be... Um, proficient in. Now, you also get skills from your background, so you're going to want to sort of pick your background um, first or alongside with your class and then compare what skills you get from both so that you don't, you know, accidentally end up in a situation where you've, you know, you're like, oh, wait, I'm getting history from both. That's pretty stupid. Let's let's backtrack here. Here's the, the starting equipment I was mentioning earlier. So in addition to you get stuff for free from your background and you do get a little bit of spending cash as well that you can personalize. But here built in, you start with as a cleric, a mace or a warhammer plus scale mail, leather armor or chain mail. And that's what you just start off with for free. Um, I suppose you could probably do like a house rule where you ignore these equipment blocks and just give all starting characters, you know, 100 gold or something like that, and they can just buy whatever they want. Um, and, and that's fine. No one's, you know, no one's forcing you to do this. But honestly, eh, it's not necessarily bad. Um, here's our, our, our growth chart. Again, the proficiency bonus grows exactly the same as just all characters. You get a variety of features we'll look into in a second. Cantrips known. You can see you start off with three as a cleric, same thing as a wizard, and then you do gain some extra cantrips going forward. And again, these are known, and you can cast these cantrips as well. Over here, we've got spell slots for spell levels. The spell casting works quite a bit differently, and we should probably start talking about that now. Uh, well, actually, when I scroll down to the magic block. So let's take a look at some of these. Oh, right! I forgot. The cleric actually starts with a few more. In addition to the mace or warhammer and the armor, you also start with a either a crossbow or any other simple weapon that you want. And you can start with either a priest pack or an explorer's pack. And in the uh, equipment section, they talk about what's contained in these things. You also start with a shield and holy symbol. So you start out kitted out pretty damn well as a priest. Although, you, again, you don't have the proficiency to wear heavy armor. Um, certainly, you can gain that with uh, a feat, probably, and there may be a few other ways to do it. So, you can cast cleric spells. Again, you know this, these cantrips, you can cast them as at will. So, all right, here's how spell casting works. Spell casting in 5th edition will sound a little bit more like how sorcerers do it, for example, in 3rd edition. You do have to prepare spells in the morning, or, you know, whenever. You can prepare spells, but this, those are the spells... It's basically like spells known. I will prepare Cure Light Wounds. You only prepare it once, and then I can cast it. If I cast it, I use one of my spell slots. And Cure Light Wounds is a first level spell, so I can I can tick off one of my first level spell slots. So this means I can cast Cure Light Wounds twice, or maybe, uh, what's another spell that might be a level one spell? Um, bless. Let's say I prepare, um, how many spells can I prepare? Um... You can prepare spells equal to your Wisdom modifier plus your Cleric level. So let's say I'm a level 1 Cleric with a Wisdom of, of 14. That gives me three spells I can prepare. So I've prepared Cure Light Wounds, um, Bless, and I, I'm not sure what the, uh, the spells are in 5th edition. Um, so whatever, and some other spell. So then I get in a situation I can cast Cure Light Wounds twice. I can cast Cure Light Wounds once and then Bless once or something like that. And later on, you can use higher level spell slots to cast your your spells. So I could cast a Cure Light Wounds using a second level spell slot if I would like. Uh, it gives you uh, the ability to sort of respond to things. There's a little bit less bookkeeping in that you don't have to keep track of exactly which spells you've cast. You just have to keep track of how many spell levels have been cast. As someone who frequently spe plays spell casters, I'm a big fan of this so far. I really like this sort of flexibility. Um, it, it And with uh, with clerics, they know all cleric spells, and then they just prepare a certain number of them. Wizards still have their spell books, but they will still operate on this sort of uh, procedure. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, you also have the ability to... Uh, so here's your uh, your DC. 
It starts off at a base of 8, which is very different than you might be used to. Um, and you'll notice that the spell level does not factor into the spell DC. It's your proficiency bonus, which will grow over time. So at level 1, our theoretical cleric here with, um, with a wisdom of 14 would have a spell DC of 12. 8 plus their proficiency bonus, which starts off at 2, plus the wisdom modifier, which would be 2 in this case, so a DC of 12 for that. And then for attack spells like raise and so on and so forth, uh, pretty straightforward proficiency bonus. So basically the same as before, where you use your attack bonus, but here it specifically uses your wisdom modifier fire as a priest when you're making a spell attack as opposed to you know if you're using a ray casting as a wizard or whatever you would use dexterity in classic systems or in third edition anyway not so much in fourth and i think this is a i think this is handy um there's something to be said about you know accurate wizards that are good at rays that need a lot of dexterity but you know there it is Ritual casting is interesting. Some spells have the ritual tag. Sometimes they're optional, like they can, you can cast a spell normally and it'll burn a spell slot, or you can cast it as a ritual, which generally takes longer. It might be like 10 minutes to cast it as a ritual, but that will not consume a spell slot. As a priest, or as a cleric, sorry, you still need to have the spell prepared, um, because otherwise you'd have access to like all spells ever. Uh, so you have to have the spell prepared, but it doesn't cost you one of your spell slots per the day. I was actually a really big fan of the ritual casting system in 4th edition, except for the fact that your normal quote-unquote spells were always combat spells. So now it's back to the 3rd and 2nd ed and so on system where spells are just spells are just spells. Some are combat ones, some are utility ones and things like that. And you just, you just have access to everything. You're not, you know, forced into a certain uh, path, but it still has this ritual casting idea, which I always thought was very entertaining. Uh, as a wizard, it's quite nice. You don't have to have a spell prepared to be able to cast it as ritual. You just have to have it in your spell book. And I freaking love that. Uh, you can have a spell casting focus as a holy symbol. We'll look into those later on, but they can give you some benefits when you're casting spells. And then you pick one domain as a cleric. These work differently from the third edition domains. And in the base game here, they, uh, they only have the one domain, the life domain. Everything else will be in the player's handbook. Um... And it gives you some extra benefits, uh, which we'll scroll down. We'll see the actual domain in a second. We'll see what, exactly what it does. At second level, the cleric gains the ability to channel divinity, which lets you turn undead by default. Works a little bit differently, but uh, perfectly fine. And uh, the channel divinity will also be modified by your domain. Uh, Every character class, as far as I can tell, has this ability that every time they reach level four, they gain a bonus to an ability score. They can either add two to one ability score or one to two of them, but you cannot increase an ability above level 20 using this feature. Um, and I believe the way that feats will work is you can trade some of these pluses for a feat instead. So if you want you know, to mix and match how you customize your character, I'm not 100% sure because the player's handbook is not actually out yet, but I think that's the idea. Uh, so every character class will get this, uh, clerics and destroy and dead. Anyway, uh, divine intervention. I don't think we're going to talk about that. Uh, it's not a, necessarily a big change to the base game. And yeah, so domain. So what can they do? For example, if you are this life domain, um, so there are some domain spells, which honestly, what does it do? I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the domain spells do. Uh, I feel like would it be described over here? Spell domain. Let's just, there we go. Um, once you gain a domain spell, you always have it prepared. It doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. Oh, that's fantastic. So if you pick life domain, you always have cure wounds and bless prepared no matter what. So then you get three additional spells. So as a first level cleric, even with a puny wisdom of 14, you would actually have five prepared spells. You can only cast two, but you have a lot of options open to you and options are good. Then a few more spells there. You get a bonus. So with the life domain, you get heavy armor proficiency for free. So you can really play your classic cleric that way. Um, and you gain massive ability to heal. You heal a lot more because it adds two plus the spells level. Uh, and um, your channel. Oh, this thing. Preserve life is insane because you can burn these sort of channel divinities. Instead of turning undead, you can heal any creatures within 30 feet of you and divide the hit points based on five times your cleric level. So at level one, it's only five hit points, although it's quite handy that you can spread it around and all that. But later on, like level 10, now you're doing 50 hit points, you know, to people who you want to heal. You don't have to touch them. It's fantastic. Um, and then, well, you know, you can read most of these. These are not like rule changes. 
So a fighter, so with its D10 hit dice that is much closer to everyone else, what's the deal going on there? So you are, are proficient in lots of things, as we mentioned, you get some skills over here. You get quite a bit of equipment to choose from. Um, it's interesting that you can start with chainmail or leather plus a longbow. So that's sort of classic melee versus uh, ranged character build. Wep martial weapon and a shield or two martial weapons. You still get another option down here to get another ranged weapon if you want. A little crossbow over here or two hand axes, which can also be thrown. And Dungeoneer's Pack or Explorer's Pack. So as a fighter, you have to choose a fighting style right away. You choose archery, you get plus two to attack rolls with ranged weapons. Awesome. You can choose defensive, which gives you plus one bonus to AC while you're wearing armor. Dueling is very interesting. If you have just one melee weapon equipped, you get plus two bonus to damage rolls, which enables a certain style of character that was always kind of hard to do. Yeah, this duelist, you know, you've just got the, the one sort of fencing rapier in your hand. Well, now you're actually kind of dangerous in that combination. And then great weapon fighting is when you're using a two-handed weapon. If you roll a one or two on the damage die, you get to reroll that die. That's fantastic. You do huge amounts of damage with big, beefy weapons. Protection is very, very interesting. One of the things I did like about 4th edition is that it made it possible to play a sort of tank character. A character who could force the enemy to sort of attack him as opposed to his teammates. Well, this is great. If you're adjacent to a teammate who gets attacked, you impose disadvantage on that attack roll. How great is that? It is, and you have to be using a shield, but if you're next to someone and you've got a shield, if someone attacks your buddy, they're going to have a really hard time hitting him because presumably you're getting in the way with your shield and just sort of blocking and giving the other guy a hard time. So you are making it more likely that the enemies will decide to attack you and you are pretty beefy. And here's two weapon fighting. When you're using the two weapon style, you get to add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack, which presumably means you don't normally add your strength bonus to your offhand attack roll, unless you're a two weapon fighter. So as a fighter, as any type of fighter, you get second wind. Once per combat, basically, because a short rest will reset this. Once per combat, you get to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. This is what I'm saying as a fighter, even though the other classes have hit points that will be closer in total to you, you are going to be quite a bit tankier. That's only one thing. You also get the ability to get action surge later on, which once per combat, basically, uh, you get to take a second action in a combat round, right? So on your turn, you can take one additional action on top of your regular action and a possible bonus action. Some of the action names are, are different now. There's the regular action, the bonus action, which would sort of be your, f not a free action, but like a swift action. And there's also a reaction ability. But yeah, so you basically, with action surge, you get to attack a second time or quaff a potion or, or do something of that nature. At level three, you will take a martial arch type, which we'll look at down the road. Um, oh, the ability score improvement. I did not realize this. They aren't the same. So the cleric, the cleric gains an ability score bonus. Oh, not every four levels because it's at the 19th as well. So fourth, eighth, 12th, 16th, and 19th. So mostly every four levels, they get the ability score bonus. But a fighter gets an ability score bonus at fourth level and then sixth, eight. 12th, 14th, 16th, 19th. So it's sort of kind of every fourth level, except there's an extra bit in between. So they get a lot more ability score bonuses. They still can't go above 20 using this feature. And again, I believe you can cash in these ability score bonuses for feats instead. So kind of a callback to the uh, the third edition fighter that got tons and tons of extra feats. At fifth level, you get a second attack for free, and that's in on top of the action surge, which is pretty cool. At level nine, you get to reroll any saving throw that you fail. Fantastic pretty strong. And then if we look at the archetypes in the basic set, there's only the champion ability, but that gives you bigger crits. And uh, in fifth edition, you get a critical hit on a roll of 20, period. You roll a 20, you get an automatic critical hit. There's no roll to confirm or anything like that. A critical hit, you roll your damage twice. You only add the modifier once. So if your damage is 1d8 plus 3, then when you crit, it will be 2d8 plus 3. Unless I'm wrong, I'll have to double check when we get down in that section. Um... But here, you get to double your critical range as a champion, which is pretty good. At level 7, you get extra bonuses to your proficiency checks and things. This is less sexy. At level 10, you get to choose a second fighting style. That's that whole, you know, two-handed versus ranged versus defensive versus this. At 15th, now you crit on an 18 to 20. 
And again, there's no confirmation roll. If you roll an 18 or higher, and assuming it's a hit, you will just crit, which is great. And then Survivor, at the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to 5 plus your Constitution modifier, if you have no more than half your hit points left. So if you're between a 0 and half of your total hit points, then you will, you're will you basically regenerating at this point. Congratulations. Fighters are tough. Take a look at Rogues. Rogues, then we'll put a cut after this, because this has gotten quite long. So a Rogue has... Again, hit points, proficiencies, skills. Skills, they get to choose four skills. Rogues are still the most skillful of them all. You get some equipment that you can start off with, and you get expertise. So at first level, you choose two of your skills, or one of your skills and proficiency with a thieves' tools. So like the tools are almost like a secondary skill type of category, which is kind of weird. So basically two skills. And you get double your ability, your double your proficiency on all checks with those things. And then at six, you get to add more. So again, not only do you have more skill proficiencies, but you skill harder at things. Sneak attack. So sneak attack is, you know, still 1d6 extra damage at level one and then grows over time. What has changed is there's no more flanking in the game. Flanking does not exist. So you get to use your sneak attack whenever you have advantage on the attack roll, which can happen like surprise and that sort of thing. But uh, the attack must use a finesse or ranged weapon. But... You don't need advantage if another enemy of the target is within five feet of your target. So this is the sort of replacement for flanking in, in this game. As long as you have another ally in melee combat with your target, then you will get to add your sneak attack damage. So you don't literally have to be flanking where you're on opposite sides of one another. You just need someone else engaged in there and distracting them, and then you get to do your sneak attack bonus, which is good. You got the Thieves' Cant for secret messages, cunning action. Um, you can take a bonus action each turn in combat, but it has to be dash, disengage, or hide. You, you can't just use it. You can't use cunning action to get, like, double attacks or anything like that. But it does increase your mobility in combat, dr combat dramatically. Level 3, you take an Archetype, we'll look at that down there, or Archetype, Archetype, either way. Ability to score improvement, um, oh, again, the Rogues get one at 10th, as opposed to every 4th, quite interesting, okay. We can see the Sneak Attack bonus and how it grows, um, relatively good, I'm, I'm thinking that's, you know, that's actually basically the same as 3rd edition, right, because it was a D6 every other level, I think, might be wrong. Uh, you do get Uncanny Dodge at 5th level, but this one is very different. Um, when you get hit by an attack, you can use your reaction. So your reaction is something you have one reaction per round, and that's usually how you would do like an attack of opportunity if someone moves away from you. Well, as a rogue, if you get hit, you can burn your reaction to just cut that damage in half, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, it doesn't help against like concentrated attacks, but the odd blow from time to time, you can do that if you're willing to give up your reaction. You do get evasion later on, which lets you take half damage if you're doing dexterity saves. Um... Or no, sorry, my wrong. Uh, you take no damage if you succeed a saving throw and only half damage. So this is actually improved uncanny dodge, basically, from third edition. So a bit weird. Or no, improved evasion. Derp. I'm messing up my name. But anyway, standard stuff that you might be used to. Uh, and then reliable talent. This only kicks in at 11th level. But when you're making an ability check that lets you add your proficiency bonus, so something that you're proficient in, you can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. And actually, I'm realizing um, above, I think I said something when the, when the halflings, they roll a one on an ability check. I believe skill checks are technically ability checks. It's just their ability checks that you add a proficiency bonus in, because like if it's a athletics type of thing, well, that might be a strength or dexterity ability check, but you can add your, your proficiency bonus because you're proficient in athletics or something like that. So they'll actually get to reroll their one on basically any d20. But yes, this ability is insane. Rogues, I mean, you're not going to have to worry about rolling a 1 while disarming a trap. The biggest barrier is just, you know, if you needed like a 14 or higher. There's still room for failure. But, uh, but yeah, very, very cool. Blind Sense, Slippery Mind, Elusive, all those things. Let's take a look at the archetypes. There's only the Thief archetype in the uh, basic rules. Third level, you can... Your bonus action from Cunning Action allows you to do a few different things. Dexterity, you can do Sleight of Hands, Thieves' Tools, and a couple little things like that. Second story work, you're better at climbing, or you climb faster. Supreme Sneak, you have an advantage on stealth checks if you move no more than half your speed on the same turn. Very cool. And so on and so forth. Finally, the Wizard. Ah, one of my favorite classes. Um, abilities are a little bit more spread out than some of the others, but, you know, we got spells. That's okay. So, uh, D6, two skills, some amount of equipment, 
start and you, you do automatically start with that spell book and spell casting. So the cantrips work the same. We start with three and you can cast them at will. You've got a spell book that starts with six first level spells at level one. That those are your known spells. You get to choose, but you just have your six. Preparing a spell works basically the same way you expect. Um, you choose your intelligence modifier plus your wizard level. That's the number of spells you can prepare. So, um, and that's across all your levels. You can theoretically, um, you know, once you get to level 10 with an intelligence of say 16, you would get 13 spell levels. You could theoretically memorize 13 first level spells, assuming you had that many in your spell book, but that would be crazy. So anyway, they've got examples of there. So that's the way it works. And then when you cast the spells, you cast them out of the spell slots, just like we talked about with the cleric. Um, the progression is the same in terms of uh, levels. Yep. 17th level, 9th level spells. There you have it. Uh, you do get sort of maybe fewer lower level spell slots, especially since you don't get to add ability. High ability scores don't give you extra spell slots. But Again, this is more flexible. You don't need as many spell slots if you only burn a spell slot when you actually cast a spell and it's the spell that you want, um, which is really, really handy. Because one of the things with the wizards always was, oh, you get all this flexibility. Yeah, it's great, but I'm only going to have like one of all the spells memorized and, you know, that, that kind of sucks. But here, and as a sorcerer, it's like, well, I know fewer spells, but I can like cast fireball like six times a day, which is pretty cool. Well, now as a wizard, you've got both the flexibility of being able to memorize a lot of diverse stuff, including things that probably won't come up. But if it does, you're like, ah, I have the perfect spell for this, you know, the Batman type of thing. Uh, but at the same time, you don't sacrifice your ability to just nuke the crap out of something if it comes up. Um, if you've only played fourth edition, yeah, the difference between the wizard and sorcerer is not going to make any sense to you because the mechanics of the sorcerer work completely differently. Um, Spell casting ability, DC attack thing, same as a cleric. Ritual casting, same as the cleric as we discussed, but you don't have to have the spell prepared. As long as you have the spell in your spell book, you can cast it as a ritual, and it does not cost you a spell slot. And I love this system so much. Oh God, I love it so much. Um, and then spell casting focus, you can use an arcane focus as a spell casting focus for your wizard spells. I believe, and again, I'll have to confirm, but I believe this will just give you pluses to your DC and attack rolls when you're using spells, uh, which is uh, something that fourth edition players will be used to and not third edition players and honestly I like the idea of getting items to boost your spell casting. When you level up as a wizard you add two wizard spells of your choice to your spell book. They can be an, of any level as long as you can technically cast them. So when you level up from one to two they're going to have to be two first level spells but when you go from two to three and you have un suddenly unlocked second level spell slots then you could add two second level spells which might be a good idea. Obviously you're always going to have more first level spells than anything else. However there's instructions down below for copying more spells into your spell book. If you happen to find scrolls or an enemy wizard sp uh, spell book or something like that, you can learn spells that way, which is great. Arcane recovery. Once per day when you finish a short rest, you can recover one spell. One spell slot, rather, I should say. Um, and they have to be, you know, less than half your wizard level. Uh, so yeah, it's, sorry, spell slots, you can actually recover multiple spell slots. Their example is really good. It's half your level. So as a fourth level wizard, you get two levels worth of spells. It can be a single second level spell slot or two first level spell slots. That is a once per day thing, but again, gives you that option and flexibility. So it's halfway through the day, you've spent a few spell slots. You're like, okay, you know what? I'm going to recover this and this level spell slot. You know, if you're, so if you're level six, you can do a second level spell slot and a first level spell slot single third level spell slot or three level ones so you get to sort of you know again get a little bit of that flexibility a nice little bonus just to keep the the juice flowing throughout the day second level you get to pick an arcane tradition which matches up with a spell school abjuration conjuration divination enchantment evocation illusion necromancy or transmutation we'll take a look at the example in this book which is the evocation you get your ability score increase only every fourth level as a wizard darn and then later on, you get some spell mastery and stuff and signature spell, but those are super high level things. So let's not worry about those. So what does one of these school specialization look like? So um, evocation savant, you get to copy spells at half price. Yay. Uh, sculpt spells. So for area of effect spells, you can leave holes in the effect to not hurt things. So you can fireball an area and not hurt your own people. They, uh, automatically succeed on saving throws and take no damage. They normally take some damage even with a successful save. So there you go. Cool little ability. Potent cantrip. At sixth level, your damaging cantrips affect even creatures that avoid the brunt of the effect. The creature succeeds on a saving throw against your cantrip. The creature takes half the cantrip's damage, if any. So a lot of the cantrips are like save 
if you save, you take nothing. Well, here, they still take at least half as an evoker, which is kind of a cool ability. And then later on, you can buff the damage a little bit further and have some other abilities that, that come up later on. Um, so, personality and background. So this is an interesting thing. They've got, uh, you know, this is your fine tuning of your character, but this is also where they pre present the backgrounds. Now you can create your own, you can do different things like that, but they do have some built-in ideas over here. So for example, the acolyte is good for uh, someone who grew up in a sort of priest priestly lifestyle. Obviously going to be very popular among clerics, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, a fighter could still be someone who worked at a church, you know, even though they weren't an actual cleric, cleric, that's possible. It gives you automatic proficiency in insight and religion two free languages, this is the Acolyte one, and some equipment, holy symbols, prayer books, some extra cash, that sort of thing. Ooh, incense, nice. And every one of these backgrounds also gets a little extra perk on top of that. So as an Acolyte, you command the respect of those who share your faith and can perform the religious ceremonies, your deity. So you are someone, you are, you're sort of a cleric, or you're a priest who doesn't channel divine power which is kind of neat. Um, you and your adventuring companions can receive free healing and care at temple shrines. Uh, and yeah, you can, I don't know, marry people or something like that. You get your certificate off the internet. That's how it works. And then you've got the, the traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Now, they do have this die roll around here if you want to pick one at random, but you, you can pick one manually. You don't have to roll, and you can make up your own if you want. These are just suggestions. They, they're to help you get started. And I frankly, I quite like the, uh, you know, you may as well have it there. You don't have to follow this, but I like that it exists. So, and then if you follow your trait, ideal, bond, or flaw, if you role play according to this, uh, the DM can say that you are now inspired, and then you get to take an advantage on a future role. So we got a bunch of other backgrounds. We're not going to go through all those, but they all have that sort of thing going on, which is quite cool. Uh, folk hero, you get pick a defining event that you know affected you, and then you get your rustic hospitality. As a sage, again, you know two free languages, which is nice. You get the researcher bonus that allows you to recall recall lore that uh, the DM might feed to you. The soldier one, which uh, gives you I like how like, little things like an insignia of rank, like literally you are you know an official soldier, maybe away on leave or something like that, <laughs> and you start with gambling stuff and. Oh, this is proficiency, gaming, and some sort of land-based vehicle. Um, like what, like a catapult, maybe? Equipment. Um, so there is a starting wealth over here, so you do still get to buy your gear. So that you do start off with stuff for free, but then you still get to customize your experience if you want. And again, you know, your, uh, different gaming parties will decide to do different things there, so I don't think anyone should whine about uh, preset equipment things. Uh, weapons, equipment, getting things on and off, great stuff armor class benefits so here we can talk about the um the armor which has changed a little bit again we've got the light medium and heavy categories and this is always a weird thing like in third edition dnd there's never any reason whatsoever to choose medium armor because it had all the disadvantages of heavy armor but not the ac benefits so that sucked but in the base thing so light armor is just you just put it on it just does what it is if it happens to be the padded armor then you'd actually get a disadvantage on stealth checks but for leather or studded leather Basically, it's just giving you an extra plus one or plus two to your AC, and that's all there is to it. Uh, nothing more to be said. On medium armor, your AC bonus, oh, I think it's, it's higher up, your, your dex modifier bonus to AC is capped at two. So if you're a highly dexterous person, you won't get a benefit from using medium armor. But other than that, if your dexterity is 14 or less, then, and you have proficiency in medium armor, then you may as well use medium armor instead of light. There's no reason not to. And what's actually really interesting is that you don't necessarily get a disadvantage to stealth right away. And I like this a lot better than the stealth penalties, you know, which was like, oh, minus two for this armor and minus four for this. Listen, it's just disadvantage on or off. I like it. So you could actually go all the way up to a breastplate, not get disadvantage to stealth, get uh, potentially up to a 16 AC using your dexterity modifier. That's not so bad, actually. And then finally, there's heavy armor. First of all, you always get disadvantage to stealth. Secondly, if there, there may be a strength requirement over here, obviously you probably want to have the, the armor proficiency, otherwise things are going to be bad, but assuming you have the armor proficiency, uh, you can basically just wear ring mail for free. Notice you do not get any dex modifier whatsoever to your armor class while wearing any heavy armor. So you probably, maybe if you had a dex modifier of plus one, you might still, you know, be willing to uh, do some heavy armor, although probably you'd want to go for half plate in that case because it would actually end up with a 16. But you know, you wouldn't want to go ring mail, but whether you wear half plate or chain mail at that point really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. If your dex modifier is only plus one and the chain mail is certainly a lot cheaper, but unless you have enough strength to meet this requirement, 
you will lose 10 feet of speed. So you go from, say, a 30 to a 20. Uh, this would not apply if you're a dwarf. Dwarves are immune to this. Um, but there you go. So you want to have enough strength, generally speaking, to wear the right armor. All the way up to heavy plate, which has an AC of 18, which is the highest that you'll probably end up doing um, out of any of these. Yeah, pretty much. You're pretty much guaranteed to have the highest AC in the party, you know, before magic and other weird things start to kick in. Assuming you go full plate, very expensive. You do need a strength of 15, and obviously you're never going to stealth anything ever. And the shield just gives you a flat up plus two AC bonus, which is quite good if you're willing to sacrifice your offhand. And again, you do have to be proficient. Got a series of weapons over here. Not going to go through them all, but at a glance, the uh, damage seems to be pretty much the same as before. Long sword is 1d8 slashing. It's versatile, which means you can wield it with two hands if you want, which point the damage goes up to a d10. And also, if you're a big two-handed fighter bonus, then you can get those uh, those benefits where you get to reroll your ones and twos, which actually turns into a pretty good amount of damage, actually. Um, then they talk about, like, finesse weapons. Let's use your dexterity. Oh, your choice of strength or dexterity. Oh, that's quite cool. Okay, very nice. Um, heavy weapons light weapons, so on and so forth. I won't go into all of those necessarily. I don't think that's important. We've got a variety of other uh, equipment that we can purchase. And I like this sort of, you know, second slash third ed style equipment list. It makes me feel very good. I know I was talking about putting in a cut here, but uh, maybe we'll just keep ticking on a little bit longer. No, we will put in a cut uh, because we are very soon going to be going into the, uh, the combat option. Uh, we will talk about multi-classing very briefly. It is an option. You can choose it or not, you know, you can use it or not use it, but basically it works exactly how you'd expect from like the third level system. When you level up, you can take a class in a different class, and that's all there is to it. Uh, they do clarify that you only get max hit points on your hit dice at level one of your character, not your class and um, things like proficiency bonuses and things like that, and your experience track are based on your character, not your individual classes like that. So I could go level one wizard, decide that level two I want to grab fighter, so I get heavy weapon proficiency, or heavy armor proficiency, and then I can go back for my third character level, I can pick up wizard two. So I'm a level two wizard, level one fighter, and then keep going that way. Um, you know, not everyone does that sort of thing. There's pros and cons to it, and it certainly complicates things a tiny little bit, but it's the right way to deal with multi-classing. It feels good. And yeah, it talks about how, how all these things combine, and it's totally fine. Mentions feats over here. At certain levels, your class gives you the ability score improvement feature. Using the optional feats rule, you can forgo taking that feature and instead take a feat of your choice. So there you go. So either you get plus two to stats, or you get a feat. The feats will have to be pretty good to compete with a plus two to a stat, though. On the other hand, your stats do cap out at 20, so once you hit, like, a strength of 20 as a fighter, maybe there's really less benefit to uh, to getting any more stats. I mean, you know, constitution is nice, but hey, feats are pretty good, too. All right, so we will put a cut in here, and when we come back next time, we will talk about uh, the rule changes in part two, playing the game. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.